Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm J. Jean Rose Burney, the Deputy Director of the Western New York Land Conservancy. Some of you know the Land Conservancy well, but for others who are out there watching tonight who don't know us, the Land Conservancy is a not-for-profit land trust that works in the Buffalo Niagara region in New York State. And we help landowners protect their most important farms and forests and meadows and wetlands. We're lucky tonight to have Dr. Suzanne Samard uh, to present on her recent book, Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest. After she presents, Nancy Smith, our executive director, will ask a few questions and talk with Dr. Samard. Then we have a panel of a few other people who also have some questions. I'm looking forward to the conversation. It should be fun. Uh, in total, this event should last about an hour and a half. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce our executive director, Nancy Smith. Thank you, Jean. Good, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much to Dr. Samard for a lifetime of commitment to our forests and for sharing your passion with us tonight. Thank you to our panelists who've joined us in our virtual theater for questions. And thank you to everyone who's listening in. As a 30 year old land trust, we are constantly re-examining the best way to execute our mission of land conservation for this Western corner of New York state. We have protected 98 properties covering over 7,000 acres. 36 of our properties are forest covering over 3,000 acres. The last two preserves that our community helped us protect are home to old growth trees. As we think about our changing climate and dec declining biodiversity, as we launched the Western New York Wild Way, our most ambitious large scale conservation initiative in our history, we are deeply interested in your thoughts on, as you describe in your book, how we can save trees and how trees might save us. The Allegheny Wildlands is the forested property that we're currently working to protect. It's basically the side of a mountain. It's the home of remnant American chestnut trees, black bears and bobcats. It's part of a globally significant important bird area and the site of freshwater springs that impact our water resources. We are so grateful for the research that you have led and that you have embraced the important work of crafting elegant and engaging stories to share your discoveries with the public. Our community so greatly appreciates the opportunity to hear from you about the ways that your research might inform decisions that we make here in Western New York. It is a great honor to introduce Dr. Suzanne Samard. Thank you so much for having me. <clears throat> it's my great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to share my screen and um, here we go. So um, I'm, I'm actually hailing to you from British Columbia um, in a little town called Nelson. And Nelson is in the unceded territory to two of our First Nations, uh, the Sinaiaks and the Tanaha Nations. Um, most of my work has been done in this area um, and in collaboration with a number of First Nations people. Um, and what I'm going to show you today is really the fundamental basic research that I, I've done over the last 40 years. Um, and uh, and I'm going and I and I'm not going to show you sort of the current work I'm doing on a project called find uh, called uh, the Mother Tree Project. And I hope that you know you might ask me questions about that or maybe we can save it for another day. But this is really the fundamental underpinnings of what I've discovered about old growth forests and mother trees. And I'm presenting you to this spiral, just to, it's, it's a common symbol um, across many cultures. Um, it's a spiral of enlightenment um, where, you know, often people um, start in the center, looking to the east um, and as a newborn or as a, a person being enlightened and you go on this journey. And I, I really, I've been on this journey, this journey of learning and increasing awareness. And you can think of, yourself as well going on these journeys, we all do. And as you grow and uh, get a better, bigger perspective, you can think of yourself as an eagle spiraling up and up and up and seeing more and more of the world. And, um, you know, 
and, and it's not just, you know, a one way street, we have to center ourselves too and spiral back down when we, we hit roadblocks, we don't know where to go next, and then get past that and spiral out and get a better and better view, not just of ourselves, but our families, our communities, our whole environment. And I'm hopeful that, you know, as we progress as a, as a planet or as a group of species that that we are able to embrace this wholeness and i i want to mention you know this, you'll recognize this of course in many cultures the sufi tradition the the north american first nations the um that have that lived here for thousands of years this is sort of like the medicine wheel too of the integration of the heart mind body and soul once we get to this you know these outer spirals so my book finding the mother tree is really about my own spiraling journey trying to journey outward and outward and sometimes going inward at the same time um so where am i you know i'm showing this old old map of the original people um that lived in North America prior to colonization. And I know that you are in New York on the west, on the East Coast. I'm way over across the continent in the, in the West Coast. I'm in what's called the Kootenai region. Um, I grew up in the Sekmamek territory or what, or, the, or what colonists called the Shushwap region. And my research really covers this entire area here, this mountainous region in British Columbia. And we can take a closer look at this. These are um, represent the language groups of the different nations, First Nations in British Columbia prior to colonization. And really when, when the Canadian government took over, they didn't really recognize these 30 language groups. They actually didn't recognize a lot of the values of First Nations. Um, and they delineated the nations into 203 First Nations and gave them names. And that is, you know, uh, is changing. Um, you know, most of these territories are unceded territories. Rights and title have not been settled. There's lots of controversy. Um, and I'm hopeful, I'm very hopeful that, um, that we, we are moving forward, but it's a very slow process. And I'm hopeful that this um, reconcil our truth and reconciliation process will help um, move us forward, not just socially, but ecologically and economically as well. So with that, um, I grew up in these forests. So these are what we call the inland rainforests. This is in the Sequimek Nation. Um, and my, my grandparents settled in these forests. My great grandfather um, moved or came from France and moved across um, Canada, logging in Quebec, and then eventually ending up in British Columbia. And there they, they horse logged. So I come from multiple generations of horse loggers. And they were selective loggers. So uh, my grandfather used to, you know, used to show us how he would go into the forest and pick out that one tree they were going to fall that week, you know, and it would take a week to fall one of these great big trees. Um, and they eked out a living. They weren't rich by any means, but they, they did uh, make a living from harvesting the forest. Um, but they came to a land that was already um, occupied by people. And of course, by many, many other creatures, including the salmon. And these really are forests that are salmon forests. All the forests are influenced by the salmon. Salmon are a fundamental part, as much a, fun, a fundamental part of the forest as are the trees. Um, so all the rivers have spawning salmon where they go back to their natal streams. And a lot of these salmon end up in the forest through various vectors and, and fertilizing the forest and really, you know, making it such a productive, amazing place. And if we look back and uh, at, you know, salmon cedar trees were all fundamental to the values and the worldviews and, and the way the First Nations people lived in British Columbia. And this is, I'm just gonna show you some of the ancient um, fishing technologies that they used. Um, this is a weir. And this weir um, was used on calmer rivers like this one, where um, they were able to count fish, for example. They were able to uh, notice or, or at least document and, and understand the variability in the populations of the salmon and then respond accordingly. And one of the main practices, as I understand it, is that, is that they would always select 
the big mother fish to go upstream to spawn. They wouldn't keep the mother fish, they would keep the smaller fish to, to maintain what they needed. And in so doing, they were able to keep the populations really strong and, and the biggest fish were always big and productive. Um, so this is really a conservationist approach and very attuned to the land and the variability in the land. This is another fishing technology near Lillooet in the Lillooet Nation. And um, I actually worked in this area and I saw um, the Lillooet people fishing in these ways. These are really old technologies where they would use spears and bring up these huge fish in one fell swoop and then gut the fish and dry it right on the banks. And, and also using dip nets, dip nets another uh, ingenious technology in this really fast flowing river. You know, and if you fell off of one of these planks, you know, you, there's no way that you would survive. And so um, really the fishermen were so adept uh, and so skilled, it was incredible to watch. And here's yet another ancient fishing technology on the west coast of, of British Columbia. And these, what you're seeing here are ancient tidal stone traps along the shoreline uh, of the Heltzik Nation, which is mid coast of British Columbia near Bella Bella. And what this is, is that the, the Heltzik people built these traps along, and, and, and if you look at, this is an aerial photograph or a satellite imagery actually, um, and you looking down and you can see the contours of the traps um, that follow the contours of the coastline. And there are hundreds of kilometers of these traps all up and down um, because it was this technology was used by many nations, including the Tlingit, the Haida, the Simsian, um, the Hiltzik, the Kwakawak. You know, they were all really, really adept at this. And this was another passive fishing technology where um, when the tide came in, especially and only on the ebb tide, any of the fish that were trapped behind these stone walls were passively harvested and the big mothers were thrown back into the ocean or allowed to continue their journey upstream to spawn. And in so doing, this always kept the, the populations vigorous and strong and abundant. And this, um, this relationship with the land, this relationship with the fish, with the trees, the integration of the ocean and the land was celebrated in art. And this is a Simsian longhouse um, where you can see the salmon um, depicted on the, the doors of the longhouse. And the chief, this is probably a, a chief um, and celebrating the, the great abundance of these resources and the looking after and the obligation to care for these resources. And so when I started out my research, of course, none of this uh, knowledge was, was known, or, or at least in the colonists who took over the fishery uh, resources, who took over the forests, this knowledge, this ancient knowledge was ignored by colonists. And, you know, when I started working in forests, I really didn't understand the, the importance of this knowledge either. And, um, but I, you know, later learned as I got older and wiser and continued on my spiral of development, learned that, you know, when I started studying forests and the connection in forests, that this connection was long, long understood. And I was looking at mycorrhizas, which are a fungus that grows below ground and how these fungi are fundamental to the growth of forests, that all trees need these fungi to explore the soil for nutrients and resources and bring them back to the tree in exchange for photosynthate. Well, you know, I thought that this was discovered by European scientists in, in, uh, in Europe, in Germany specifically, but actually this was known for a long, long time in North America. And um, Subier, Bruce Miller, who was a, a, a Coast Salish man, wrote about his understanding of these fungi and how they were vital to the health of the forest and that these connections kept the forest strong and healthy. So this knowledge was known long, long before Western science came along. Um, and so this, this celebration of this knowledge of, or of, of this, I, this notion of connection, this celebration of that we are all connected together as one, all the species, not just people, but the trees, as Robin Kimmerer talks about, the, the strawberries, all as one as a people. And there are so many words in these languages, in these ancient languages, the first languages that describe this, uh, this, this idea, this worldview that we're all connected. And this, this is a, a word from the Coast Salish, the Hamalkaman group of languages, and it's Netsamots, that means we are one. 
So here I come along, not knowing this, not knowing any of this, um, but knowing a little bit about European science. And I'd learned about this study um, when I was becoming a young forest researcher, trying to understand, you know, what we, what I saw, what, what we were doing, making mistakes in forests and forest management, what I saw as disconnecting the forest. And I learned of this study that was published in Nature by a man named David Reed. And he had done this little study where he, um, Took, went into the lab and he had these little glass boxes, garden boxes, and he grew pine seedlings together. And he called, he inoculated them with a single fungus, a mycorrhizal fungus. And he, and he labeled with one of the trees, um, this tree over here, say, with carbon-14. And he was able to see that through using radiography that, that these trees were actually connected together by these fungi. And of course, as I mentioned, you know, Subier already knew about this, but this was brand new to, to Western science. And it was published and celebrated in Nature. And I came along wondering, as I was watching our forests become disconnected through poor management practices, whether or not these kinds of connections where actually plants um, could be connected together, not just pines of the same species, but I wondered, could trees of different species be connected together? Could plants in the understory be connected to trees? Were these all, you know, as one, just like the, like, you know, the Coast Salish people understood. Um, and so I started studying it. And um, I started out in the forest around my home. And I worked with Douglas fir. Douglas fir is a really uh, prominent species in the West. Um, its distribution is from northern Mexico all the way up to northern British Columbia. So it crosses this huge climatic gradient. It's a really important species economically, ecologically, uh, socially, the whole, you know, it, it's important to everybody in the West. Um, but these forests are under a, a great deal of stress. And so I, I wanted to study them because I wanted to understand how could we, you know, help as climate is changing. So I went to the forests around my home. These are uneven age forests in this particular example, in this region, this climatic region. And um, you can see that there's trees of all sizes and all ages here as well. So these big old trees here are, are about 200 years old. And then there's some in intermediate ones here that are probably like you know under 100, maybe 75 years old. And then we've got some saplings growing in the understory that range from new germinants all the way to saplings that are like 20 years old. So we call these multi-cohort stands or uneven age forests. And I thought this was a really good place to start with looking at connection. For one, we knew quite a bit about Douglas fir. And secondly, we already knew quite a bit about the fungal species that associate with Douglas fir, the mycorrhizal fungal species that is. And there had been quite a bit of work on understanding the genetic code. What was the genetic, um, the sequence of genes in, 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 these, in these trees? And we were able to use that information to um, explore this below ground network. And so um, what we did is we went into these forests. I had a graduate student, Kevin Byler, who spent five years of his life doing this. Um, and he basically mapped out where all the trees were in a, in a small forest and where all the fungal species, all the fungi of one species of fungus, knowing that there are about a hundred species in here and how these trees and fungi were linked together. And so he made this map and let, let me explain the map. So these circles in the map represent trees and the bigger the circle are the bigger the trees and the darker the circle, the older the trees. So this circle here is one of the biggest oldest trees in the forest. It's probably about 300 years old. And you can see all these trees in the understory, they're all smaller, um, younger, and the smallest and youngest ones are those little saplings I was talking to you about. So there's a few really important discoveries from this map alone. So for one, um, this is what is called a biological neural network. It's, it's, the, it's the pattern of the network. These kinds of biological neural networks exist across nature in many, many guises. So we even have neural networks that cover landscapes at the landscape scale, the way that water flows through landscapes. They follow a network pattern like this. Um, networks exist in forests like this, not just of fungi, but of like, for example, birds that fly 
fly from one tree to another, they also form networks. Bacteria form networks like this. Even how you know animals travel through forests, they follow networks. And we use networks even in our own mimicking, we mimic them in our own transportation systems, our communication systems, they're ubiquitous. And they're ubiquitous because they've high, they're highly evolved and they work really well. You know, they're really efficient at moving materials around. They're highly resilient. Um, they're they're just you know they've evolved to be to be uh, you know very productive and very very efficient. So here we go um, in this network. This tree here, of the trees in this hundred by hundred foot piece of forest that contains 66 trees, this tree is, is linked to about 57 other trees. So it's linked to almost 85% of the trees in the forest. So this is in network theory is called a hub. And um, so, so these big hubs, um, they are, you know, they, they link to the most trees, they're the most highly linked. And the reason that they are is because they have big crowns, lots of photosynthate in them, and they have huge root systems with lots of fine roots for lots of points of connection with their neighbors. And that energy flows from the crowns into the roots and feeds this massive network that is old, it's ancient. And if we were able to map all of these species, we'd find that it's far more complex and thicker and more dense than what I'm showing here. Um, another thing to notice here is that the, the younger trees have established in the network of the old trees. So these young seedlings here, the seed has fallen from the crowns of the old trees. They've established and their new nascent root systems um, become colonized by this big network within about a month or two of their est establishment. And these little seedlings benefit from this vast uptake capacity of the network. And they benefit from being uh, colonized by old, old fungi, fungi that have all these different niches of accessing resources. That's not the whole story, though. So we started doing a lot of experiments to look at, you know, what else could this network doing? Because we already know that fungi and colonization helps, but one thing helps establishment or regeneration of forests. One thing we found out is that when we tried to, when we did experiments isolating these little seedlings from these old trees is that their survival went way down. So they had about a quarter of the survival rate as if they, as when they were connected to these old trees. And it turned out after many, many experiments later, we, we learned that these old trees are actually sending uh, resources to these young seedlings. So water, carbon, nitrogen. Um, and even as we got to learn more and more about this, that they also sent information, not just resources, but information. So information about the status of the old trees and whether they were related to these young seedlings or not. So, so information about species, identity, location, you know, how vigorous the old trees, how vigorous the young trees were. And we discovered over time that these resources moving through this network followed gradients. And we call those source sink gradients where you have rich individuals providing resources to those in need. So this really illustrates a, a pattern of collaboration in the forest among old trees and young trees and trees of all ages. But I wanted to emphasize that it's even more sophisticated than this. You know, trees compete with each other at the same time while they're also collaborating. They're very sophisticated and they're nuanced and they're very perceptive of, of the shifting uh, source sink gradients with shifting over the course of a day, over the course of a month, or over the course of a year. So they're, they're highly attuned to each other. Um, so what is a, a mother tree? Well, these, as I mentioned, they're the biggest, oldest trees in the forest. You know, they're obviously, when you walk in the forest, they're the ones that really catch your eye and you're just going, yeah, th these are the centers, right? These are, are what center us. They have gravity to them. Um, and, you know, so there's smaller trees around this, but, you know, a lot of all forests have got variation in structure like that, where there's some big trees and a lot of smaller trees. Um, and so all forests, even if they're all of the same age, you'll have these big old individuals that are really like the, the center of the forest or the linchpins of the forest. 
And so in back to the First Nations and the, the um, importance of elders in First Nations cultures in the West Coast, and I think all across North America or all across the world, is that these, these old ones um, are so important in not just for us, but in our own societies of, of passing wisdom on to the next generations. And Robin talks in her book about how so many uh, words in, in, in Aboriginal languages um, you know, they, they're not nouns, they're verbs. And so the, the elder, it's really what the elder does, um, not just in the human communities, but in old forest communities too. These old trees play extremely important roles um, in the forest. They're very active players in the forest. So just to, just to mention, you know, again, they're essential in the resilience of the forest. They provide seed, they provide the networks in which young seedlings regenerate, grow up, become adults and become mother trees eventually themselves. Uh, we also know that they're homes for the, you know, many, many species. They're incredibly diverse. They're like the, the, the foundation of a huge microbiome that includes fungi and bacteria and salamanders and birds and bears. Um, they use, you know, they, they contain nests and nest webs for all kinds of creatures. Um, another important factor that we're studying quite extensively now is, is also their ability to store carbon. And we all know we're thinking about carbon these days because of climate change, but big old trees and scientists are really, you know, emphasizing this these days is that even a few of these big old trees uh, in a forest store a huge amount of carbon. They really are crucial in the balance, the, the carbon pools, the carbon balance. They can, you know, they can actually store, you know, 80 or 90% of the carbon above ground carbon in a forest. They can be so important in that way. And they continue to uh, sequester and store that, that carbon over time. And it used to be that we used to, you know, foresters called these old <laughs> and decadent trees to get rid of them. Um, but now we know how you know extremely valuable they are, not just in the life cycle of the forest, but are in their ability to, even as they're getting older and older, to continue to accrue carbon and store it and house it and protect it. Okay. Um, so one of the things that, that I wanted to also talk about is kin recognition in forests. This is something we've been working with a scientist called Susan Dudley, who, who is at McMaster University. And she started working with kin recognition in plants. And so we asked the question together with our graduate students, our joint, our shared graduate students, do trees recognize their own kin? Is there kinship? Are these concentric relations? And it turns out that they do, that these old Douglas firs do recognize which of the seedlings around them are their kin. And they, they in that perception, they change their behavior either to favor those kin, to provide elbow room for them to grow. They'll adjust their root systems. They adjust their mycorrhizal networks and they pass carbon straight into those kin seedlings. If the neighborhood isn't very conducive to re-establishment of their own kin, then they'll sh sort of shoo them away. They'll increase their competitive behavior and, and so that the seed seedlings that are dispersed further away actually establish and are more successful. And in so doing, they avoid sort of um, not su such good areas, su pathogen laden areas, for example. Okay, so I'm just going to, I'm going to move on a little bit back to salmon. So, um, you know, I mentioned that salmon is such an important part of the vitality of the forest along the West Coast. This is a village near Bella Bella called Hayat. It's a 6,000 year old Haltzik village. Um, and this village, even though you can't see the um, um, the original village that the people now are going back to this village and have established a whole youth uh, environment, youth camp, and they've reestablished the salmon beds. Um, they're re trying to reestablish the ancient tidal stone traps. They, um, they, take the youth there for months at a time and teach them the old ways of knowing. Um, and so, you know, we've been studying these rivers uh, as well. And, um, my graduate students and my postdoc, Dr. Teresa Ryan Simhayatsk of the Simsan Nation, were trying to look at um, the role that salmon play in the forest more directly. And um, so one of the things we're interested in is how the, the salmon actually ends up in the forest and how, and, and it turns out that grizzly bears 
and uh, wolves and ravens and eagles carry salmon into the forest. And bear, a, a bear like this, a grizzly like this, can carry 175 fish straight into a forest. Um, and they mostly eat them under the big old trees where they can see all around. They can see potential predators. They can protect their cubs. And they eat the fish, or at least they eat the brains and the guts and leave a good part of the, of the, of the flesh of the fish there to decay. That decaying fish is picked up by the mycorrhizas which we're studying and that really influences the mycorrhizal community, uh, you know, what the fungal species are. And it inf also influences the insects. It influences the, the small mammal communities. It influences the amphibians, uh, but the mycorrhizas themselves are influenced in a big way that they, it, they change the, the, the community identity really. And the mycorrhizas pick up this salmon nitrogen, which we can in detect using carbon, or sorry, ni nitrogen 15, which is a heavy isotope of nitrogen. It accumulates in salmon out in the ocean um, as a heavy isotope, and we use it as a natural tracer. And what we found out, and others as well, is that the salmon nitrogen ends up in the tree rings. And we can actually core these trees, some of these thousand year old trees, and measure how much N15 is in each tree ring and reconstruct what those salmon populations were like. Um, and um, yeah, so I just, this is just a photo showing a, a salmon that is decaying along a stream bed and how that decayed flesh ends up in, in the tree and leaving these bones. And so, um, as a researcher, it's actually really easy to find these, these mother trees with where the bears continue to going back because they could be heaped with gleaming mounds of salmon bones because they're visited year after year after year. And so this is what, you know, gives vitality to these forests. This is what makes them so, one of the things that makes them so productive. And um, we're really interested in how, you know, with the, with the, colonization and taking over of the fishery from the First Nations and, and actually, you know, deconstructing those ancient tidal stone traps so that the DFO, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, regulated the own, their own, the salmon fishing themselves. Um, and we all know that there's been a demise of the salmon populations. They're down to only a, a few percent of those original populations that were so carefully stewarded by the original people. Um, and we're interested in finding out and reconstructing some of these ancient tidal stone traps and finding out what is the impact on the trees? Can they recover? Will we be able to see, you know, the N15 rising up again in those tree rings after it was lost so dramatically uh, with the fish, the new fishing technologies? And, you know, this is important. It closes the circle, right? So um, these, the salmon fry that spawn in, or that, that hatch in the spring depend on these old trees to shade the streams, to provide detritus to the streams, to nourish the streams. Um, and, and therefore, you know, they can go out and carry out their life cycle and then return to their natal stream to close that cycle again. And I, I want to emphasize here too, the importance of the original people, the first people, in closing that circle, they are such a vital, positive agent of productivity in ensuring the productivity was maintained of the salmon and the forests and of the people as well. And of course, this helped them in so many ways. The tree of life is cedar, and cedar provided, you know, the longhouses and the canoes and the family poles and the the, the bark for making clothing and baskets and mats and, and so on. Um, and the First Nations were always so careful about harvesting that um, that bark so that the trees were were able to continue on. They only took a small portion. And I found this really interesting um, here. This is a maple tree living next to a uh, a Western red cedar. And uh, Teresa taught me that they would always look for um, the big leaf maples to harvest cedar bark because that was, those were the wettest, most richest soil and it was easiest to pull off the bark. And the bark was, you know, of the right quality, very supple and strong. Um, so, and I, you know, since I've been working on mycorrhizal networks, I now know that the yew tree, or sorry, the maple tree and the cedar tree and the yew tree are all connected together in a single network in these forests, which is fascinating to me. So what happened to this knowledge? Well, I mean, I might, you might have heard um, in, in British Columbia that there's, um, you know, we're going through a great deal of, of um, grief right now, of um, uh, understanding of the past, 
of uh, acknowledging what happened to the many uh, First Nations and their children with colonization of the removal of kids from their homes and put in residential schools and the tra tragic result of that for so many of these kids. And I have to say, you know, in current forestry practices, um, which includes, you know, in my neck of the woods is mostly clear cutting and weeding out native plants is not that much different than this colonization attitude towards First Nations in Canada when, uh, when the Dominion of Canada was formed. And we have a long, long ways to go to, to change and uh, rectify or to reconcile these, these situations in forests and in our society. So just as an example, here is an old growth forest. This tree is probably 3000 years old. Um, it's in Fairy Creek. Fairy Creek has also been in the news lately. Fairy Creek is one of the last bits of old growth that's left in uh, British Columbia. There's only 3% of these iconic, huge old growth forests left with huge cedar trees. Um, and people have been protesting. Um, they've been standing shoulder to shoulder with, with the Pachitot people, the Haida people, trying to save these old forests, because right now this is what's happening to them. You know, basically they're all slated, most of them are slated to be clear cut. It's all in the big plan to harvest our forests and convert them to plantations. And Haida Gwaii, for example, which, you know, many of you have heard of the Haida people are the people of the salmon and the cedar. And the whole island, Graham Island, is slated to be clear-cut logged to lose all these iconic cedar trees. And this, this really does need to stop. And we are seeing, you know, a great social movement now also propelled by what people see around them. You know, the sea of clear-cuts that once used to be the old growth forests are now these planted plantations that are bereft of the diversity that, that really makes them whole and integral. This is one of the islands off of Haida Gwaii. You know, this is a was a beautiful Sitka spruce forest. And, um, you know, once these forests are gone, you lose carbon, you lose biodiversity, you lose, you know, the people, cult the cultural aspects, the spirituality that is so vital to these the people in the forest. And not to mention that, you know, removing these old trees places the whole landscape at risk. And what we're finding is that, you know, in British Columbia, that we've had these huge mega fires um, driven by climate change, but also by the removal of, of elder trees, because these old trees are more fire resistant. And when we replace them with flammable con conifers in this patchwork planta plantation or landscape, what we find is that the whole landscape is more vulnerable, that we have way more fires, they're more extensive, they're more severe, um, and this doesn't have to be this way. And so we're protesting. The, this is the Haida protesting on Haida Gwaii, um, joining the people, the, the Pachita at, at Ferry Creek, joining all the nations across British Columbia, joining the Engos and the youth and all of us who are, are alarmed by the state of our forests. People are getting arrested. Um, there were 200 arrests at Ferry Creek alone over the last two weeks. So I feel like we're on the cusp of change, but we have to keep pushing, keep pushing and working together to make it better. So it is a spiral of learning. It's a spiral of awareness. Um, I try to um, illustrate you know, my research and what I feel, what my values are in my book, Finding the Mother Tree. And I'm hopeful um, that this will help everybody see the forest in a different way as social creatures, that the forest is a social place, um, that trees are not that different than us, there are relations, um, and that we need to protect them as though they are our own family because they are. And with that, um, if um, I'll just leave you with this, Netsamats, we are all one. And if you feel ever disconnected from a forest, or from your environment, just go sit by a tree. Um, it only takes a few minutes and there you are. Your heart is melted with the heartwood again. So thank you so much. That was amazing. And also very troubling. I feel like we cannot learn the lessons of what you have just said fast enough. So, and I'm also, you know, as I read your book and you were afraid I can't go to that protest or I'll lose my job. Now you can go. Yes, <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. Yes, it is. <laughs> so I have a ton of questions for you, but I'm going to limit myself to three because there are a lot of other folks on the, our panel tonight that also want to ask you a question. So first, um, you're not only a visionary leader in reimagining the way we think about forests, but you have also been a courageous and persistent advocate. 
confronting powerful institutions, asking questions that you know full well will not be well received. Our world is faced with so many complex and daunting challenges. Climate change, declining biodiversity, systemic racial inequities. Yet each and every day, it is our job to face the world as it is, not the one that we hope it will become. At an event in Point Reyes, California that was called the Geography of Hope, Women in the Land, one of my friends made me go to it, I don't know why. <laughs> it was co-led by Robin and the attendees were asked two questions. What is it that you love too much to lose? And what will you choose to do about it? I think about you driving long hours through the night, clinging to a tree with a mother bear pacing down below and speaking before a packed room of forestry professionals who you knew were not like-minded. Can you offer any guidance to all of us on how you have found the courage and persistence to address the challenges that spoke to your heart? Mm, that's such a great question. Um, so I grew up in these old forests, like I, I said. So these forests are in my blood and my bones. Um, they are me as much as I am them. And, uh, and so when you you see your home being clear cut and um, changed and, uh, and also just knowing after studying for us for so long, even, I mean, I didn't even need to study them. I cared from the very beginning and I always knew I was a little bit different. I was a bit of an odd kid, I guess, um, but lots of kids are like that, but I, I you know, I, I was extremely shy. I remember even I, I remember being so shy, not being able to speak out, but I learned how to how to stop sucking my thumb and to start to speak out um, um, because I cared so I care about the forest. And then, of course, um, as I as I became a mother, you know, it became more, and climate change became more real to me. Um, I didn't just learn about it in school. I could see it happening and it's affecting my kids' lives. And, you know, and they're growing up in this world, of, you know, where it's a, it's a kind of a scary future to look at. And, and I just thought, you know, I, I knew that this was my life's work. I knew it from the beginning, but I've just have had more, you know, I've just, it's more and more crucial now. And, and it's, um, and I don't want my children to suffer. I don't want any kids to suffer. I don't want the, you know, the many generations to come to suffer. And so I'm, I'm you know, I decided a long time ago, I was gonna do whatever I could um, to, con to contribute in whatever way, you know, knowing my background, having that special uh, opportunity to grow up in these old forests that I had this, you know, I had this, I was privileged to be able to live there. And it gave me a perspective that I can see that my colleagues at the university that I work at, most of them don't have that perspective. They, they come from different backgrounds, but I came from that particular background. And so I, and I worked in so many aspects of the sector from industry to government, to academia, that I, I wanted to bring all those different perspectives that I'd learned uh, to have a voice on what was happening. I don't know. It's, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's that's great. And I guess that's it gives me um, encouragement that one of the things we care a lot about is connecting people with nature so that more people have that connection. So thank you. Um, so we're a land trust uh, and we protect 3000 acres of forests. And I wanted to know what you think the priorities should be for us as we steward those lands. Yeah, well, so I think, you know, there's things at big scales and little scales. Uh, you know, at the big scale, we're, we're grappling with global change. Um, and that means climate change. It, it also means loss of biodiversity. It means like, you know, more nitrogen in our environment. Um, um, migrations of people, migration of all organisms um, as climate is changing. And, and and it's, it's hard, right? It's gonna be, the, the impact is enormous. We're seeing it every day already. Um, and so one of the big sinks for carbon, there's the ocean, but the next one is the forest. So forests, even though they only cover 30% of the terrestrial land base, they store 85% of our carbon. And so without, if just to, as a thought imagination, imagine if the forest suddenly all burned down right? All that carbon would be released to the atmosphere, all the soil carbon, most of it would be mineralized and released, and we would completely swamp out whatever fossil fuel inputs we're having. And so it's absolute, and, and you know, we're, 
it's kind of happening, right? It's happening kind of slowly, but then we're exacerbating the problem with our forest management practices. Never mind, climate is changing. And so to me, we want to slow that down. We want to slow it down so that we can that we can have a positive influence on these forests. We can steward the forests, like the First Nations knew how to steward the forests, to so let us learn and help the species move. Um, and, and in order to do that, we need to save the big sinks for carbon. And that means the old growth forests, right? They're the huge sinks for carbon. If we lost those old growth forests, you know, in British Columbia, it would completely swamp out whatever emissions that there would be three times the emissions if we were cutting down our old growth forests. So that's the number one priority is save the forests that we have left. So old growth forests that are the big ones are the most important. And then any primary forest that hasn't been disturbed yet by, by you know, logging, they should be saved as well. And that means if where logging would occur, it should be on second growth forests. And in second growth forests, you know, you can also mitigate the losses by leaving old legacy trees, leaving the old trees, the coarse woody debris, of course, leaving the soil intact and healthy so that they can rebound and even take on old growth characteristics almost, you know, very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, so that's what I would do. I prioritize saving the old forests as much as you possibly can. And then, you know, focusing, if, if you're going to cut, focus on allow, you know, making sure that there's a lot of legacies that, that they can recover quickly. And then for degraded forests to, to steward them back into production and, and, or into health, I should say. And that can be done. We have good restoration techniques where we can use islands of trees as nuclei to grow and expand out and help the land recover. I'm so glad you mentioned talking about different scales because my next question is sort of more of a micro scale. So as I think about Robin Kimmerer's guidance, um, that if you can only do one thing, garden, um, nurture and be in a reciprocal relationship with one place, um, much of the land in our country is our yards. So mm -hmm. it's covered with turf grass and a really narrow list of species that are chosen for their ornamental value rather than their contributions to our web of life. So um, when I think about your statement, the trees can save us. And I know that for me in the time of COVID, I spent a ton of time in my native plant garden and that was a critical coping strategy for me. Yeah. So my small yard includes a miniature prairie that's smaller than my garage and there's tons of native plants crammed in between the sidewalk and the street. Is there any guidance from your research on the role of soil health and mycorrhizal mm. fungi and plant communication that can come into play at the scale of a yard? Oh, for sure. Absolutely, for sure. <laughs> you know, the foundation of a forest is good soil. And um, good soil means a living soil. And a living soil means all the critters that drive this, like these biogeochemical cycles, the nitrogen cycle, the water cycle, the phosphorus cycle. They, we need a healthy soil food web because the, the way it works is you have you know, all these creatures down a food chain that eat each other. It's an eating chain. And as they eat each other, they excrete um, nutritious soups full of nitrogen and phosphorus and all the minerals and nutrients that plants need. And so that it's really essential that that food web is healthy. That means having, you know, the large cr critters, the columbula, the, the mites, the springtails, and then the nematodes and the fungi and the bacteria, you need the whole suite. Um, and how do you do that? Well, first of all, they need you know, photosynthate to drive the cycle. They need energy as well. And so, so soil needs to have living plants, you know, preferably native plants, native to the area. Um, and, um, and if the soil is depauperate for whatever reason, if it's degraded, if it's, it's had a lawn on it before, um, you can rejuvenate that soil by um, bringing in compost and bringing in native plants and re revitalizing the soil and, and returning it to that native prairie like you successfully did. So yeah, in and of course, lawns, you know, I, my, my dad was, uh, he loved his lawn too. And he used to, you know, back, I don't know what it was about lawns, but um, I remember him, you know, dousing it with different chemicals. And I'm like, dad, you know, like this is killing everything. It's like, oh no, but the lawn is so important. Well, really, I think that lawn was dead for the most part, except for the green grass that was growing out of it. And, and so, I mean, ripping up those lawns is important, I think is important, right? Like what was the lawn for? I, I, I heard on one radio show, it's really a status symbol, right? It's supposed to, it's like, oh, my lawn is perfect. And, 
and square and your it's better than your lawn. Well, you know, let's let go of that because <laughs> it's more important that we have, you know, healthy ecosystems that are you know, that provide food. We can grow food in them. We can have, you know, we can have other creatures come in and live with us and, and be comrades like the, like they they should be, like they are. So yeah. Well, I'm kind of thinking about opening a can of salmon and leaving it out on the yard tonight. So <laughs> um, this, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over to J. Jean for other questions. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Nancy. Uh, so next, I'd just like to invite Robin Wall Kimmerer to ask a question. Robin is a SUNY Distinguished Teaching Professor at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. She's also the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the teaching of plants. Robin? Thank you. Um, Suzanne, I have so enjoyed following your work and now this, this wonderful book. So mostly gratitude. Um, gratitude for the wonderful science, for the courage to ask those questions, the brilliance in answering them, um, and the courage to advocate for, for trees. And my question revolves around, you know, I've been so gratified to see how you not only provide evidence in the Western scientific framework for the web of relationships that are a forest, but that you so clearly recognize and honor Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous science as well. You know, the recognition that the knowing that that trees are in kinship networks and mutual mm -hmm. support and indeed have their own culture has is part of Indigenous knowledge. And it's so rare to have a scientist acknowledge and hold that up. And so I, I, I can't thank you enough for 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 the way that you speak about that. And what I'd really want to know is, you know, you have described these amazing old growth forests and honored old growth cultures and the knowledge of First Nations people. And I wonder if you might reflect just a little bit about what are the parallels maybe in the the teachings or or the or the ways that both old growth cultures and old growth forests are are organized what what are the points of convergence there thank you that's, that is a really that's a great question robin and, and i have to say i i'm so grateful that you're here and that you wrote your books because i learned so much from you as well and um it really did help shape my understanding more fully and deeply so thank you too um yeah the convergence of old growth and old cultures. It's interesting, we, we've actually um, sp explicitly asked about that convergence in a study on um, mother trees and how the Heiltzik viewed old trees. And, um, and it, it, there is a convergence. So the, the old trees, the old growth provide, um, you know, a sort of a longevity, a wisdom of longevity of, um, of what it was like in previous generations of nurturing the coming generations that the role of these old trees is vital. Um, and that, um, you know, honoring the trees is also vital. And, and what we learned with the, from the Haltzik people is that they, they called their trees, the, their old cedar trees, the, cedar, the tree of life, um, their grandmother trees. And they honored them like their grandmothers and their grandfathers. Um, um, and, and knowing that, that, that the grandmother was vital in providing food and shelter and, uh, and that wisdom that carried the generations forward. And, um, and so, you know, and of course, that is also a convergence with, um, um, you know, how elders are honored in the Haltzik culture, that, um, that the elder people hold that wisdom, that they are the teachers of the next generations, that, um, that they hold the communities together, they, they hold them. And, um, and you can, you know, that the young people can rely on the elders for, for, for helping, you know, move forward and guide forward. 
And so there is this great convergence and um, between the people and the culture. And it's kind of, I was, you know, we were specifically also asking, you know, how does this Western knowledge, like this Western science that we apply to understand or to identify in, in our simple studies, the importance of these old trees from a Western point of view, can there be a convergence of those, of those ways of knowing? Um, and I, I'm hopeful that there is, but I, I feel like the Western science is like the little sister to the Aboriginal science, that the Western scientist has so much to learn from, um, because Western science is such a reductionist approach. And we're only lately in the last 10 years coming out of that in a very, very small way, you know, developing this area of science called complexity science, where we understand that relationships are so important, just like the relationships between the old trees and the young trees and the elders and the young people, um, that, that relationships are also what hold systems together. Um, and we didn't really understand that when we were studying all the parts and not looking at them as relational creatures. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that, that we'll learn from, from this way of knowing, this Aboriginal way of knowing, of seeing the whole world as, as a connected thing, that what you do to one part affects another part, that, that we will be able to see that more clearly and that we will learn from the Aboriginal knowledge holders, the elders and the, and the scientists who are doing work in, in, the, in the nations, um, that, that they can inform the Western science and that Western science can help shine a light on that incredible knowledge. So I sort of see my role in my discoveries, uh, in my rediscovery of what Souvier already knew and wrote about, that it provides, you know, colon colonists, you know, Western people, a license to uh, embrace that knowledge and, 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 um, and help build on the knowledge that, you know, and we're going to need to work together, right? Because it's not, the past is not going to be the future. The future is changing so quickly. We need all hands on deck. We need all kinds of science to work together to help us get through, you know, the mistakes and heal the mistakes that we've made. Um, so, um, and I, I feel like, you know, with my work, you know, in working, reading my book and that people are reading it and they're, and they're going, oh, I, now I see the forest in a different way. That is one small step towards doing that. And we need more of that, right? We need people like me. We need people like you, Robin. We need people that, that can shine the light on the convergence of those cultures so that we can move forward in a more meaningful, holistic, scientific way that really does look after the land, that, that we can fulfill our obligations to look after the land and be good stewards. Me Thank you for your Thank question. You so much. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Whitney Dorr with some questions. Whitney is the Deputy Director of Friends of Trees in Portland, Oregon. Hi there. I am completely um, inspired and honored, um, kind of awestruck and to be here, uh, especially with you both. I've been listening to both your books, you and Robin, side by side. And so um, I've had my four and two year old listening with me. And uh, it is it is so um, it is rejuvenating my soul for sure. Uh, so thank you. And my question is more um, I'm curious your thoughts that you might have about your work on the importance of mycorrhizal networks and how they translate to a more urban setting. Mm -hmm. Here in Portland, Oregon, we plant over 3000 trees along streets and yards in neighborhoods. And I'm curious if we can better prepare these teenage trees as they go into their new homes, often really far from others and surrounded by sidewalks, pavement and utilities and the like. So would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't actually work in urban environments, but I, but trees are trees and soils are soils and it doesn't really matter. You know, the principles are, are similar. Um, what I've seen in urban environments, you know, where they're building, constructing things, when you see that big, you know, basement pad being built the big you know excavators pulling out the earth and then putting trees back in like the sea horizon or you know gravel and you know basically soil that doesn't most of the life in the soil is in the surface layer it's in the it's in the forest floor it's in the a horizon or or i think in the in the states you call it the o horizon or the e horizon and um that's where the living soil is and they scrape it off and then they put the tree in this 
sort of like the soil that doesn't have much life in it, that food web isn't very rich down there. And so the first thing to do is to make sure the soil is good, right? When you're planting trees to have good compost, good soil, or bring soil in from a natural forest, if, if you can. I mean, I've done that in many in many restoration projects that I've been involved with, including restoring mine spoils, where you can bring soil in from a healthy forest, like you don't want to destroy that soil there, you have to be very careful about that, but you can bring that living soil in and plant your trees in that or make compost, it will serve a similar function. And then, um, you know, planting good trees that are native plants, native species are the best adapted, you know, to their environment. So that's another second principle. Um, you know, we tend to bring in European trees, like, um, you know, like trees that aren't native to the area. So if you can, if you can capture those native plants, that's better. And then the, the third thing is, you know, trees are social creatures. And in urban environments, we seem to have missed that whole concept. You know, you see these trees in rows and they're by themselves. Um, maybe, you know, they may be 20 meters apart or more, or, or maybe even less, but they can't connect. They, they don't have their social life. They, they're not, you know, their relationships are depauperate. I mean, so growing trees more in clusters, I think is important. So diverse clusters as well. And, you know, this kinship, this concentric thing about trees is important. You know, the local seed that, that comes from those trees and allowing them, other trees, to their, their offspring to regenerate around them that can bring up the next generation. So, and I know all of these concepts are quite different than what how urban, urban environments are managed right now, um, but you can, we can move in that direction. And, and from what I understand, you know, you talked about how you plant 3000 trees a year, I think, is that, is that what you said? Yeah, so the longevity of those trees is quite low, right? Like they they don't live for very long, and it's because they're in crappy soil and they don't have they don't have their neighbors around them. And so we can change that and actually grow trees for longer. They can live longer if we provide these healthier environments. That's wonderful. Thank you. And I do have one more question for you um, that has to do with fire, um, mm. with increased <laughs> severity and regularity of forest fires. Um, especially here in Portland, really being impacted um, the past couple of years. I'm curious about the impact of fire on the mycorrhizal networks. Mm. Um, and if you can see evidence in the network from previous fires or previous extreme weather events. Yeah, you know, so again, I, I go back to these basic principles. Most of the mycorrhizas are in the forest floor or in those surface horizons, the A and the O horizons. And the E horizon, <laughs> I get I get mixed up between the Canadian and the American system of soil classification, but it's the surface horizons. And so if it burns down through that surface horizon, then you lose a lot of that inoculum. And as fire severity goes up and up and up, as climate is changing, and as fuel loads have been artificially rising because of fire suppression, then there's more risk of that happening, of us losing that inoculum in the forest floor. Um, and so, you know, reducing fire severity as much as possible is important. And to do that, you know, we need to keep fuel loads lower. And that means, you know, doing what, what, what you need to do to, to reduce fuel loads. At least in the Western forest where I'm from, fuel loads have been building and building and building to this point where, you know, under heat waves and with an ignition source, because there's more lightning, because there's more heat energy in the air, um, all these things are coming together to create these, these conditions. And, and yeah, the mycorrhizas will die if they're burned right through the forest floor. Um, and then the other, so the so in addition to fuel reduction, if there is a fire, um, to make sure that the, that they're seeded in quickly afterwards, because that will revitalize the mycorrhizal networks, not to leave them fallow. Um, you know, to if if allow the trees that are remaining to to spread seed, don't cut down those old trees because they're important now in the recovery of the ecosystem. And I think, and I know up in Canada, the first knee jerk reaction is let's cut, cut down the, the dead trees because we can make money from them. Well, no, I mean, we need those elders in place even if they are dead and dying to contribute to contribute their knowledge, their, uh, their wisdom, their mycorrhizas to the next coming generations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Now, now I'd like to introduce Emery Nieves to ask a question. 
Emery is the founder and director of Gardenist Incorporated in Buffalo. She operates this organic land care company and specializes in ecological and regenerative gardening. And she even maintains the native plant gardens at the Land Conservancy's office in the city of Buffalo and at our office uh, at Kenny Glen and Nature Reserve. So Emery. Hello. Hi, Emery. Hi. Um, Hi. Suzanne, I just want to start out by saying uh, I'm like honestly kind of shaking right now. What an honor it is to A, be part of this talk and to be hearing from you. And um, I really, I just want to thank you for the work you've done, uh, getting it out there to us. I discovered you on your TED Talk. Um, and then I dabbled a little bit of reading the abstracts of your research. So um, and we incorporate a lot of the things that you're talking about as far as being more soil focused in the way we approach everything. Um, so I'm just like, <laughs> I've got a little bit of a uh, uh, jitter in my voice right now, just talking to you. So I just want to say thank you. Um, the work you do means so much to the world at large. And I'm so happy to see that there is more research coming out, um, reaffirming the things that you were originally criticized for, um, seeing the industry beginning to make the changes that your research shows is really valid and important. Um, and also, you know, just hearing from you as a mom, as a woman, as a daughter, as a sister, um, your life, it's just been really, uh, really relatable for, for me. So. Thank um, so thank you. <laughs> and, uh, so I sent over um, a couple of questions. Uh, so what is, and this is the first one, I think um, I'm allowed to do two. So uh, what is your opinion of the shifting tree lines and the species distribution in pace with climate change um, and climatic zone shifts? Um, should we shift and replant to the adjusting zones and um, as the planet warms and changes? Yeah, it's such a great question. And I, I, I do try to talk about this in my book because it is a, such a tough one. Yeah. It's so difficult. What do you aim for, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, people have always helped shape for us and played really vital and productive roles, you know, really had good relationships with forests. Um, and so we can continue to have positive relationships with forests. And yeah, the forests, the trees are, are saving us in the sense that they, they drive our biogeochemical mm -hmm. cycles through their relationship with soil food webs. Um, but we also play a role in helping trees. And so the velocity of climate change is so rapid now. Um, you know, it's about, you know, the, the paleoecology studies show on general that trees can migrate you know, maybe a thousand meters a year, uh, sorry, about a meter a year. And yet the rate of climate change is about a thousand meters a year. So it's about a thousand times faster than they they're, they're have been adapted to migrating. And so mm -hmm. what do we do? Do we just let them die in place? Well, some of them are going to, but I think that we can, we also can play a really important role in helping them migrate. You know, yeah. we call, in BC, we call that assisted migration, um, but we can't just migrate them into inhospitable environments. We have to have them in a welcoming environment, into, into a, a productive environment. And I think the way to do that, and I've been studying this a lot in what I call the mother tree project, where we've got this big climatic gradient and we're looking at how can we migrate species and what way can we help them the most? And the, what we found is the most important thing is to leave these old elder trees there in place yeah. to seed in the natural regeneration of their local seed and then bring the migrants in into this lovely welcoming environment where there is a good healthy soil that is driven by the photosynthesis of the native trees already there. There is a good mycorrhizal network that's supported by these old trees. The new migrants come in, they'll survive. Um, okay. if, you, if, they, if we don't have those, they'll die of frost or drought or some insect will get them. It's just too vulnerable. It would be like, you know, having a child and leaving them, you know, in the middle of a city without the mom or the dad there right? yeah. you, you need to have yeah. the parents there so um so that is that is the, that's the crucial and what what we found is that when we have the old trees and we migrate seedlings into them survival rates go up by 30 percent it's mm -hmm. it's astounding and it, and it also helps keep carbon in the ground and it helps maintain biodiversity and species richness so yeah, so we do have an important role to play. It's, it, we no longer can, we can't just sit back and let this all unravel because 
if we do, if we, if we don't help the forest, then we're going to start losing, you know, we'll start emitting so much carbon. We're going to, you know, already, you know, Canada has shifted from being a carbon sink to a carbon source. They're yeah. talking about the Amazon having shifted from being a sink to a source. And that is not a good trajectory. We need to mitigate that loss and we mitigate it by helping these forests um, be productive and, and adapted. No, and, and all of that really, um, it's so valid. And, and when I walk through a forest, I'm looking at what's all growing together, what's harmonious, um, trying to learn from the environment so we can, I can apply those lessons into the work that I do, um, trying to look and assess for guilds of plants. I know mm -hmm. some plants grow better together and because yes. they have this ancient relationship with one another. But as I walk through the forest, um, it's really alarming to me to see the number of invasive species that are really mm -hmm. beginning to outcompete our native, our native um, ecosystems uh, mm -hmm. from terrestrial to aquatic um, and things that we have brought in, you know, we've done it to ourselves. Um, yeah. So uh, my question is, if invasive species are a symptom of an e of ecological distress, how do we regenerate um, the land sus sustainably? Um, so, <laughs> Yeah, you know, invasive species are a symptom of, mm -hmm. of, of poor management, of poor stewardship. Um, and I think it's important, we don't want these invasive species to take over the native plant communities because they, they become dominant so quickly, right? They're invasive mm -hmm. because they're so sexful, successful at reproducing and growing um, quickly and they're root all like species. And so we play it, we have to play a role, I think, in removing those species when they come in and making room for the native plants um, and, and it's a hard job and it takes persistence. Um, and, you know, these invasive species have strategies for being invasive, you know, like, for example, in the mycorrhizal network world, I know that, that things like cheatgrass can actually tap into the networks of native plants or knapweed. They have our buscator mycorrhizas, they can oh, wow. tap into those existing native networks and suck the phosphorus and nitrogen right out of the plants. And so, you know, that allows them to invade and take over these plant communities, but we can't let that happen because, you know, they're not... If you look at those communities, they don't have the big leaf area, they, the, the soils become degraded, they change the soils. If you shift from, for example, a treed community that's dominated by ectomycorrhizas and it's invaded by, by cheatgrass and knapweed, it will become an arbuscular mycorrhizal field. And then it's mm. harder to get the trees to regenerate. So yeah. we have to keep at it, we gotta be persistent. Um, so pulling out the native plant or the invasive plants and promoting the native plants is so important. And then of course, as I talk about migration of species, I'm really talking about migration of genotypes of species, mm -hmm. right? That it's really, you know, it's like Douglas fir, for example, there's so many genotypes across this broad climatic region, variable region that there's all these local genotypes and we just need to move those genotypes, not the species themselves. Although there will be species movements as well, probably. But we have to be really careful. We ought to be smart and it's got to be science-based. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. So much of the work I do is kind of anecdotal. You know, we can see that it's working, but I, that's our, our goal um, at Garden yeah. is to begin to collect that data. So yeah, it's really important. Yeah, that's really technology. important. That is so, yeah, that's so important to monitor and set up long-term permanent plots. Mm -hmm. That's something I've learned as a forester, <laughs> a forest reacher, researcher, and it's hard to maintain them and it takes money and effort, um, yeah. but you can go back and go back and go back and you see the changes and record them. You can set up photo points, you know, that you take this picture from the same spot every year and you can see the changes. Um, it's so important, not just from a scientific data point of view, but also to show other people of what's possible and it encourages mm -hmm. them to try those things too. Well, thank you so much for your words of wisdom and for your incredible book. Um, I've You're enjoyed welcome. every moment of reading it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Now I'd like to introduce Stephen Handel. Uh, it's his turn to ask questions. Stephen is the director of the Center for Urban Restoration Ecology at Rutgers University and a member of the team designing the Riverline, the Land Conservancy's Nature Trail and Greenway in the heart of Buffalo. Stephen? Hi. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, for uh, the wonderful research you've done over the years. Uh, I do restoration in urban areas, uh, and I've learned already that the lack of mycorrhiza in urban soils is one of the limits, one of the constraints for really trying to restore urban habitats where most people live and work. 
-hmm. I got interested in the level that most people uh, manage, which is their own homes and their own yards. And Nancy Smith said she's trying to restore a little bit of a prairie in her home in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. I know that people can buy bags of mycorrhiza at mm -hmm. garden stores. And I'm sure those bags probably just a one or two species, which can mm -hmm. be grown commercially in bulk. Mm -hmm. Do you think adding those commercial mycorrhiza from Home Depot uh, really can help? Uh, what else can people do to improve the soil in their own little plots that they really care about? Yeah, I think, you know, if, if you're, if the area is really degraded and there is no or very little inoculum left, um, that, you know, you need to get the plant started somehow. Um, and if they have, if there are no mycorrhizas, if there's no spores, if there's no photosynthesis going on, you got to start somewhere. And I think that those commercial inoculums can help get plants established. Um, but they're not the only solution. So, um, you know, plants, you know, a, a lot of most, most garden plants, um, some forest plants that form are buscat or mycorrhizas, and that's what you mostly get in, you know, that you'll get from in commercial inoculum. It's rare that you actually get these ectomycorrhizal fungal inoculum, which are what trees and shrubs generally associate with. Um, and so, you know, those arbuscular mycorrhizas will help those herbaceous plants and maybe some arbuscular shrubs and trees, like cedars form arbuscular. So does maple, um, so do yew trees, um, cottonwoods and willows form arbuscular mycorrhizas. So those are, you know, you can get those started, but then if you want to have a mixed plant community or if you want it to succeed into a more mature or older forest type, then that inoculum will have to turn over. Um, and so, um, and the, the plants will kind of do that. Once you get things started, you can start introducing thing, other plants and other inoculum that will stick around because you've got the photosynthate, the energy moving into the soil from the plants. So it's sort of like, you know, you, you, you pull it up by its bootstraps. You start with the commercial inoculum and then add maybe other inoculum or maybe the plant community will be able to take over at that point itself. What we found in forests is that when we add commercial inoculum to a regular planting program, um, you know, if it's a clear cut and you're planting it with trees, um, that you can add that inoculum, but it disappears almost within a year because the native species will just take over. They're much, much stronger and they're, you know, they're, they're much more adapted and co-evolved with the plants that are there. Um, and so, so it's not a loss because you got the plant started, but recognize that those are not, that inoculum will disappear and it won't be the long-term solution. But the, the, he, the land will heal itself if you give it enough of a head start. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That's very interesting. We also, uh, related to this, recommend to people that when they do plant a native tree or shrub, they get bald and burlap stock with some soil already on it, which yeah. that probably has some of the native uh, mycorrhiza inoculum in it, and also some of the insects, even ant nests, yeah. which are so important for soil health. Yes. You can't get ant communities uh, migrating quickly to a suburban garden, for example, which the queen ants fly uh, so rarely and really not very far. Yeah, no, I think that's- There's lots that's, of little tricks to, to get the whole system uh, reestablished or restored. Yeah, yeah, and you're a restoration ecologist, so you you know a lot more about this than than I do. But you know, I've I, I mentioned I've worked in mine spoils, I've worked in you know really degraded areas, and just bringing in a cup of soil from an old tree, um, mm -hmm. um, and we even do this in our greenhouse experiments. Well, we want to inoculate our trees, we just use native soil. And so, you know, that's kind of expensive to move soil around, but, but it's more effective than bringing in one species in a commercial inoculum. Because you have, like you said, you have the whole suite of insects and the whole soil food web right there in that cup of soil. So it's highly effective. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting talk. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. And I, I just want to mention that we're, we are running a little bit late, so um, hopefully we can get through some of the last questions a little quicker. Uh, I, I'd like to invite Jean Biter to ask a question. Jean is a senior program manager uh, at Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper. Jean? Hi, yeah. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, through my work at Waterkeeper, I do quite a bit of work in our local communities through outreach and engagement. So I'm curious, what can be extrapolated from the teaching of trees and their networks that can be applied to the human condition? 
Is there some element or key feature of the tree's social and connected network that we can apply to the betterment of our own personal networks and communities? Thanks so much. Yeah, um, for sure. <laughs> um, you know, I think that, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've learned about forests over the years is, you know, a tree, a plant, um, they're perceptive creatures and communities that they are, they are defined almost by their relationships with all the other plants. They, they don't live in isolation. They're not, you know, they need all the niches in the, in the forest to be filled or in the grassland or the wetland, um, that they thrive in that diversity um, with good relationships with the other plants. And, and I, I think the same thing can be said for human communities that we're, we thrive when we have good relations, um, when we, we have good relations with our community, our family, our kids and so on. And, um, and so, you know, Nurturing those relationships is really important um, and, and to have them, you know, flexible and resilient relationships so that, you know, when things go wrong, that, that you can fix it, um, that, um, that there are, you know, there's resilience built into the system, uh, you know, the social system, that resilience comes in the form of, you know, social safety nets and lifting up the whole community and making sure that we all have good, good relations and good resources and a living wage and, um, you know, that we look after each other, we have each other's back. And I, I know that this, this is politically charged, you know, and, and you know, that the whole political parties, not just in the US, but Canada and all over the world are, are sort of, you know, in these categories of, you know, being, you know, doing more of that or less of that. And, and I just think that, you know, that it's just such a vital part of us as, as, as part of ecosystems that this, we are, ecosystems are all about relationships and we are social systems, our human ecosystems are no different, we're the same. So I think we need to honor that and look after those relationships. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now, Ellen, if you're ready, I'd like to introduce you and, and uh, let you ask a question. So Ellen Newmeyer, uh, she's led the way in saving a lot of our community's most important places. Uh, she's been a part of the Land Conservancy longer than I have. Uh, she's helped save Mill Road and, and Mossy Point. Uh, she's been the founding member and the leader of the East Aurora Village Tree Board for almost 20 years. Ellen, do you have a question? Ellen, I think you're still on mute. Oh, there you go. Technology. Uh, <laughs> but thank you very much uh, for, for the work you're doing. And yeah. as I look at your gorgeous pictures of your old growth mother trees, uh, and I, I realize that we have, uh, well, the BBC says we have uh, old forests like that that's the size of France, and, but they're fragmented and in various parts of the world. And I was just wondering from the climate point of view, uh, how, much, how much more valuable would they be if they were contiguous for us? And mm. how can we get the powers that be to uh, accept that? Yeah, I think it's really important. You know, there's, you know, there's many species like in Canada, some of our biggest top predators, wolves and grizzly bears need big home ranges. Um, the mountain caribou needs big intact forest. Um, that th those top, you know, predators and herbivores and food chains are, you know, they're keystones, right? They, 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 they help structure the entire community of, of animals and plants. And, um, and, you know, they need to move. They have big home ranges, um, and so we need intact forests for those, and then also for migration of species. So, for example, you know, if 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 a tree needs to migrate on its own or a species, then it's not going to migrate through a parking lot. It's going to migrate through a corridor that is intact. Um, and I know that there are, you know, and, and of course, migratory species like birds also need. <laughs> you know, intact forests. They need places to, to stop and land and then carry on their migration pathway. Um, and so, you know, I know that there are efforts to maintain corridors. There's the Yukon to Yellowstone uh, effort that's 
crossing you know, the US all the way up to the Yukon and maintain, maintaining this intact corridor. And there's a huge effort into doing that. It's extremely valuable and needs to be done. And, and I understand there's also a, an effort in the Eastern hardwood forest of the US, the Al Algani forest, is that right? Um, and creating corridors into in, as far as Canada. Um, I think it's in, enormously important. Otherwise we're gonna lose these, the ability of these species to migrate. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce Zanaya Hussein. Uh, she's an international studies major at the University of Buffalo. Hi, um, I'd just like to uh, start off by saying it's such an honor being able to witness the really important conversations that are happening right now, um, especially as someone who is part of the up and coming generation. You know, I'm feeling a lot of pressure, you know, being the last generation that, you know, can save the planet, can save the forest. And I think a lot of, a lot of other youth mm -hmm. are also kind of feeling that pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a very heavy task, especially mm -hmm. during a time where more and more conversations that our trees are having are being snuffed out. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, uh, how can we get more people to care about our trees during the largely, you know, industrialized world so that our trees can stick around and, and have more conversations. Yeah, that's, I mean, it is a fundamental issue, right? It's fundamental that people have good relationships with their environment, that they, um, that they re can relate to trees as their relations, as their kin. Um, and, uh, and once they do that, then they'll care about them and want to save them. That's really like, if you removed, if you don't, if you're not around trees and forests, then you know it's likely that you're not going to do much to help save them or to invest, you know, your time and effort to lobby people who can save them. Um, and so, you know, getting people out into the forest or into a park or into a boulevard or even, you know, beside a plant and just, you know, the thing, the first thing to do is just sit with those plants, those trees. Um, I do this all the time when I teach my students. So every year I teach 19 and 20 year olds, big, you know, my forest ecology. And the proudest thing that I do that, that I value so much is taking them into the forest. I mean, I do lectures as well, but the most valuable thing is to take them in the forest. And the first thing that I do is I get them to lay on the forest floor and just be quiet for five minutes and listen, listen to the forest. And it's really hard for them to do at first, right? They, they're so used to being on their phones and fidgeting and talking and, and, and I can hear them sort of, you know, settling in and being nervous with it. And then after a few minutes, they settle down. And then pretty soon you can start hearing the squirrels and the birds. And even with a hundred students laying there on the forest floor. And then I ask them, what did you hear? And, and then they, they start talking about it and it's transformative for them. Um, and then we do it every week. We go back every week and do it over and over again for the whole term. And by the end of the term, they can't wait to get back out there. And it really only takes that five minutes, right, of sitting there with the plants, with the trees in silence um, and listening to them and being with them and relating to them that, that then you're hooked in. And, and you can teach this to anybody. And, and I say it because we are all wired to, to love these trees. You know, they are our relations. They, um, we evolve from the same ancestors. And, and so it's not a hard leap to make. You just got to get them out there and give them the opportunity. And then once they're hooked in, then you can work. Then you can get people on board to really work and on conservation and the issues that are so important to to our generation, next generations of students. I have two daughters the same age, you know, as you, and and I've taught them that too. And they work in the forest and they love it. And they're, um, you know, I think that that's their home. And and it's just being they weren't always like that. I had to show them. Um, you know, they, they, we grew up that way. They grew up that way, and they had to learn. But but every, anybody can learn it. It's yeah, it's a very fundamental thing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, and th thanks everyone. So we're running just a little bit late, but we have three more questions, and I'd rather ask the questions and spend another five or ten minutes. Um, so I think that's what we should do. Uh, I'd like to introduce Andy Lance, a, a PhD restoration ecologist for the Land Conservancy to ask a question. Great, thank you, JG. Um, just real quick, Suzanne, your work has been very inspiring to me, uh, both throughout my academic and 
professional career as well. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, my, my question is very quick and a little bit maybe more scientifically based, but um, I was wondering how you think the interforest dynamics of temperate deciduous forest in the eastern United States might differ from the coniferous forest that you've done most of your work in. Um, how do you, you, you see that the facilitation of, of young trees, for example, may differ in those different forest types? You know, it, certainly some of the, the, the emphasis on the mechanisms will vary according to the local environment that you're in. Um, but, but basically, you know, all these trees form these mycorrhizal networks. Um, people have studied them in the eastern U.S. forests. And uh, we know that, you know, that, that, for example, oaks will facilitate the regeneration of, of other ectomycorrhizal species through their networks that that's been studied. Um, and so, um, and, and people that have studied these in other places, other forests in the world find similar things this, the same processes are at play. And, um, and so, you know, I, I would say you need to understand the species and the autocology of the species of the plants and the fungi and how they work together. Um, but they do work together and, and all of these, you know, they all play their role in acquiring nutrients and providing photosynthate and driving these ecosystem processes. So protecting those things and cultivating them is really important. So it doesn't really matter where you are. It's just that the nuances will be a little different according to the local area and the native species. Great. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll pass it on now so, so everyone can get a chance. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Now, Eric, uh, Eric Danielson has a question. And Eric is a naturalist with the Land Conservancy. Hi, Eric. Hi, Suzanne. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I will keep it brief. Um, working in this region, um, oftentimes when I'm out, even in very intact habitats, if I say lift a, a stone or a log and look at the, uh, you know, whatever's living underneath, um, I've been surprised to learn that oftentimes uh, the invertebrates, not just earthworms, which we know are invasive, often the common invertebrates are introduced non-native species, um, even, you know, beetles, pill bugs, things like that. And it makes me wonder about, uh, you know, introductions of other species that are less directly visible. Um, should we be concerned that in a similar manner to invasion biology of plants above ground, that a potential introduction and invasion biology of soil fungi um, could reduce the resilience of our trees and forests, even in relatively intact settings, at least in the near future. I mean, yeah, likely. I, um, I think, you know, we, we know so little about, about the mycorrhizal fungi, you know, and the functionality of them. We're just sort of, you know, discovering every, every year we discover a new species. I think we're up to 55,000 species now of all the fungal species using molecular genetic tools. And we don't know the functionality of all of them. And some will be, you know, more aggressive and competitive and ruderal like species, more invasive. Um, and so we, you know, in principle, we do need to be careful about that. And, and we've seen, you know, for example, sudden oak death syndrome, which is a, a fungal pathogen um, that was imported from Asia into North America. And that's had a huge devastating impact on a lot of native plant species. Um, and, and that was brought in with soil or, mm -hmm. you know, even um, tipping the balance, like in my area, our malaria astoria is a, an important pathogen. And we can, um, even though, you know, it's not really invading, it, we can tip the balance by tipping the balance of the plant community. And it, it would turn from being a, a mycorrhizal species on some plants to a pathogen on others. So these fungi can actually switch strategies as well, depending on the plant community and, and the vitality of that plant community. So yeah, just like plants, we do need to be careful. Um, and, and so, you know, in, I think the most dangerous thing, I guess, is in buying inoculum and, and from somewhere else and then porting it over large distances. You, you wouldn't want to do that. Um, and that would be especially a danger, I think, with ectomycorrhizal fungi. Our buscator mycorrhizal fungi, there's much less lower species diversity. And so the danger of bringing in invasive our buscator mycorrhizas is probably a lot lower, but you still would need to be careful. Um, I think, you know, taking as much care as you possibly can to avoid introducing exotics is, is, is really, I think is really important. We've seen the devastation of doing that in so many other um, kingdoms of, you know, animals and, and plants that, you know, that potential exists in the below ground world as well. Thank you so much, Suzanne. You're welcome. 
And finally, I'd like to ask Josh Ballesteri, uh, the Land Conservancy Stewardship Director, to ask the, the last question tonight. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Suzanne. This has been incredible. And I uh, love the book as well. So thank you. Ask you a, a question here. Uh, tough job with the last one here. I think you've touched on some of this a little bit. But so a lot of upstate New York is is post agricultural second growth forest. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that means a lot of our conservation properties here that we've conserved already are also kind of in that stage. Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of just wondering how long it takes for the mycorrhizal networks of forests like that um, to kind of recover to those old growth ecological dynamics. And if there's anything that jumps out to you in your research over the years, that's a particularly good stewardship management technique um, that we should have on our radar uh, as we kind of try to steward those, those post-ag second growth forests into um, try to expedite the process of those ecological, uh, old growth ecological dynamics. Yeah. Um, so I can, I can tell you about, you know, this, a study that we did in, in, in Western Canada, where we looked at a succession or a, a time span, we, it was a, a, um, a, you know, we re reconstructed a time span over the of the forest, and we looked at you know from recently clear cut to over a hundred year old forest, and looked at the mycorrhizas and how they changed with age over 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 these different forest types. Or it, it was in actually a a paper birch Douglas fir. It was a mixed forest type sort of similar to what you would have, but different species. And what we found was that, that it takes about 50 years in those forests to recover sort of the native plant, the native mycorrhizal community. Um, and, you know, as the trees grew, grew older, um, they need to reach sort of a threshold of photosynthetic capacity to feed a very diverse mycorrhizal network. And so that's when they close crown and they actually go through that self thinning stage already and they're starting to open up and become more mature forests. That's when you really see, see a leveling off of the species accumulation curve um, that you really got most of them at that point. And so, so aging is really important, letting these forests grow to the old age to, to carry out their full life cycle, you know, is important. And then, um, of course, having, you know, fungi and plants have co-evolved with each other. So having the native plant community intact and, you know, having the not in not exotic species, but having the native trees there and that will attract, you know, the, the native fungal community as well. And then, you know, so having the native plants, having them in communities, having those in communities, closing crown, occupying the site, having full site occupancy and then letting them grow to this old age is really important. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> well, I think this was, this was great. Thank you, Dr. Samard, for, for that You're amazing welcome. presentation. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone, for your amazing questions. Uh, I want to thank Kyle Semmel, who, who's not on this show tonight, but he's, he's the one who works for the Land Conservancy, who put all of this together. Uh, so thank you, Kyle. This is, this is, this is an excellent, excellent night. Um, if you haven't already, everyone out there watching this, purchased the book, Finding the Mother Tree, please do. It's a great book. You can buy it at Talking Leaves in Buffalo or wherever your local bookstore is, wherever you are tonight. Um, and once this is over, the, this link, this YouTube link will, will be on. Uh, it'll be up on the website or, and on YouTube. So share this with everyone you know so more people get a chance to see it. Uh, you know, we want more people to see this. Um, and, and at the end, I, I just like to close by talking about uh, a big, important conservation project that we're working on. Um, the Land Conservancy, the community in, in our region, we're trying to save a place called the Allegheny Wildlands. Uh, this is a 200 acre forest near Allegheny State Park down, down in the southern tier of Western New York. We're trying to save it from development. Um, you know, this forest is it's incredibly important, incredibly diverse. Uh, in great wildlife, black bear, bobcat, fisher, great birds. Um, it, it, it's really interesting because this forest, although not old growth, has a lot of really, really cool trees, including American chestnuts. There are five American chestnuts here that are between 40 and 60 feet tall, some that are flowering, some that have burrs. Uh, and this is amazing because the American chestnut, if, if you know, is, is basically been wiped off the landscape because of a, a, a fungus, a, a blight, an invasive blight. That, that killed it off about a hundred years ago. Um, and so to have that number of trees here is, is just really special. Um, we have until the end of this year to raise $879,000 to buy this forest. 
uh, to build a new walking trail so people can experience the forest and, and touch these trees and see this wildlife and, and be able to protect this place in perpetuity. Um, so if you can help, anyone out there, if you can help by donating, you can donate on our website at www. Um, www.wnylc.org. You can send a check made out to the Western New York Land Conservancy to PO Box 471, East Aurora, New York 14052. And you know, protecting places like this, this is this is so important. This is what Dr. Samard's work is about. It's protecting these important forests, these reservoirs of genetic diversity, these places where trees are uh, working together to to create this incredible wildlife habitat, and, and vice versa. Um, you know, if, if you want places where bobcats can, can have, you know, their own young grow up to find their own mates and have their own territories and roam across the landscape, uh, we need to protect this place. If, you, if, if we want a place where the American chestnut can recover, um, we need to protect this place. Um, and so I just want to thank everyone again for being here tonight. Thank everyone who can for helping uh, save the Allegheny Wildlands. And uh, thank you all for the presentation, for the questions, the conversations, and good night. Thank you.